Well, good morning. Good to have this opportunity for us to be together and an opportunity for us to open God's Word. And, and uh, I know it's not sunshine and bright here, but uh, it is somewhere. And uh, the other part of it is, is at least we're not up to our armpits in snow, you know, like some places are. So it's nice for us to be together. If you would, take your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 32 through 45 as we deal with, as Jesus walks ahead. And so this morning I want to be reading from the, uh, the New Living Translation. There were now, they were now on their way up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with awe, and the people behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, Jesus once again began to describe everything that was about to happen to him. Listen. He said, we're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die, hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, whip him, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. Then James and John, the sons of Debedee, came over to and spoke to him. Teacher, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? He asked. They replied, When you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink with the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering that I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, we are able, they replied. (laughs) Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from the bitter cup and be baptized with, with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who's going to sit on my right or left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard that James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know, that the rulers of the world lord it over other people, and the officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you is to be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is a very interesting text. There's a lot here for us to to consider. First, I want us to look at and see from verses 32 to 34, I want us to see Jesus' journey here. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem, and it's, he, that's where he's been going since he left Galilee up in the north. He's been over to Perea on the east side, crossed over the River Jordan, and now he's moving across from the river to Jericho, where he's just up the hill to Jerusalem. And since he was 12 years old, Jesus has made a number of trips to Jerusalem. He at least had to go to the feasts, you know, the three required feasts, unleavened bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booze. Those experiences, I'm sure, were wonderful. Times of celebration with his family and, and, and their extended family and, and sacrifice. But this trip was different. This was not your regular trip to Jerusalem. Jesus is on a mission. He's journeying to Jerusalem so he can surrender himself and die as our sacrifice. To finalize the very purpose that he came for his birth to become flesh, which happened in Bethlehem just up the hill. Now behind him are disciple, or the disciples, and these disciples, they are amazed. The word there, astonished, the word in the Greek has the idea that they were astounded with just a tad little bit of fear. They, they didn't understand why Jesus was so bound and determined to get to Jerusalem. Now twice before, Mark records for us that Jesus had been talking about going to Jerusalem to die, and the disciples may have been a little fuzzy on what Jesus meant. And so they're 
amazement could have been at just why was Jesus, why did he, was he so determined? Why did he have such resolve? And Mark tells us that the crowd following along were just afraid. The atmosphere was tense as they were following Jesus. It was one of those kinds of things where you could cut the tension with, with a knife. They, they sensed that there was a crisis of impending doom. Have you ever been in one of those situations where, you know, you knew something was coming? You, couldn't, you didn't know exactly what it was, but you knew something was coming and, and you were anxious. You might have lost a little sleep over it. See, faced with the unknown, most of us are really good at coming up with worst case scenarios, aren't we? I mean, we all are pretty good at doing the Eeyore thing. We're all going to die. Jesus walks ahead, and he walks with resolve. He takes 12 disciples, he takes them aside, and he tells them again what is going to happen. Now, this is the third time that Mark records Jesus telling them what's going to happen. And on this occasion, he's even more specific than he had been before. Now, Luke tells us in the account, his account, of this, that these things were happening because they were a fulfillment of, of prophecy. And so Jesus is trying to, to clue them in on what he is, is focused on, and he wants them to be prepared for what is coming. See, they need to know that as these events unfold, that Jesus had said it was going to happen this way. In fact, the prophets had said it was going to happen this way. And so this is an unfolding uh, according to God's sovereign will and plan. Jesus is going to be betrayed. He's going to be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. And they're going to condemn him to death. And they're going to hand him over to the Gentiles. Then those Gentiles are going to mock him. Those Gentiles are going to spit on him. They're going to flog him and eventually kill him. And then three days later, he's going to rise from the dead. And it's with laser focus. Jesus knows where and why he's going. And Jesus as well know what is going to happen when he gets there. But there's a second thing I want us to consider. We've got Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, but the second thing is the ignorance of the disciples in verses 35 to 40. See, while Jesus is focused on his coming rejection, he's focused on the humiliation, he's focused on the suffering and, and, and the sacrificial death, James and John are jockeying for position, positions of power in, in, in the coming kingdom, and it appears to be a little bit of political maneuvering, which we all saw a lot this last week, didn't we? It probably isn't a whole lot different. I mean, I could see James and John are kind of like backing up, getting ready to rebound and boxing out. That's what they want. They don't want the other guys to get it. They're wanting to be right there. Matthew records that it was their mother, Mrs. Zebedee, who had made their request. And Mark tells us that they also brought it up to Jesus. So this suggests that the boys had been talking to her about it. But before we throw these guys under the chariot, I think we need to make sure we understand a little bit and we hear their hearts. Why this request? Because this request seems kind of out of left field. Jesus is talking about his death and, and they're focused on going to Jerusalem and boom, out of the question, here comes you know, this question, this request by these two, two men. And when you look at the rich young ruler that we examined previously, Jesus questions this guy who he came to Jesus and he said, what do I got to do to inherit, you know, to inherit eternal life? What else do I need to do? And so Jesus focused this guy's attention to God. He says, sell all your possessions, give the proceeds to the poor, then you're going to have treasures in heaven and then come follow me. Jesus was trying to help this man understand that the way to God's kingdom comes by God's grace. Not by our efforts, not by being good enough. And so Jesus turns to his disciples and he then teaches them about sacrifice and the priority of being last and letting go of their efforts at trying to be good enough, trying to earn things, and in, instead surrendering everything everything to God, and trusting Him for everything. 
See, Jesus taught that if they, if we choose to trust God fully, God's not going to leave us hanging. God's going to supply blessing of what we need today. He's going to supply blessing for what we need for the future. And God's blessings are outrageous. They're so awesome. Matthew's account to a different audience gives an additional, some information to Mark's record. And Matthew helps us understand a little bit about where James and John are coming from. Because in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 28, it's the same teaching after the rich young ruler gets disgruntled and walks away. Jesus says to them, his disciples, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now, this is further description of, of how God is going to bless these disciples. And this took place in Perea in, uh, before this journey to Jerusalem. And talk about political line jumping. But knowing here, James and John had just learned this teaching and this promise from Jesus, that might help us understand a little bit about their motivation because there's three things that they were interested in. They're asking three things. First, they're asking for preeminence. That when Jesus sits on his glorious throne, they're going to sit on their thrones and, and judge Israel, which is an honor. It's an exaltation that Jesus had said was going to happen. Secondly, they're asking for proximity, to be up front, to be on the platform, to be nearby Jesus. It seems like it's not, you know, if you've ever been in any kind of convention and you first ever were on the platform, you're standing off on the side somewhere. You might even have a foot on a step. You know, but if you've been around a little while, you work your way in to finally you're in the center part of the stage. That's where it's all happening. That's kind of the thing that's taking place here. They want that proximity because Jesus is front and center, and it's a good thing to want to be close to Jesus. The third thing here is that they're asking for is power. Positions of recognized power and authority. So when Jesus it had sent them out earlier on a mission. He sent them out under his authority, and Jesus had given them power and authority to heal and to cast out demons. So they've already had a little bit of taste of this themselves. And we might look at that and what they're requesting, and we think, man, that's, that's just outrageous. How did they even get to this part? And I'm kind of in that camp. I really was. But in a way... What they're asking is all really good things, isn't it? These are things that have already been promised by Jesus if they choose to trust God and to follow him. So Jesus doesn't rebuke them for what they're asking for. He, he only is rebuking them for their ignorance. I mean, you don't know what you're asking. See, it's not that they were asking for the wrong things. They just had no understanding of what was involved. And I think that can be true of us today. Because don't we ask God for things that we believe are in his will? And we're ignorant of the process. God's perfect timing. And the steps that are involved that lead to the fulfillment of whatever we're asked for. I mean, we can get out of, out of step real easy, can't we? We can typically get ahead. We try to get ahead of God on things. But God is always on time. He's always on purpose. And in a sense, we can struggle to understand what God is doing. And so in the process, then we become fearful. Or we even become a little bit on the discouraged side. And we then might become hesitant to follow. Jesus goes on to explain what they're ignorant of because Jesus is on the way to glory and there is a price that's going to be paid. He's ready. He's resolved to pay that price. And, and for them to follow Jesus is going to be costly themselves. It's going to come at a high cost. And so Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? 
See, the cup represents what comes to us in life that we have no control over. Control is really an illusion. Control is an illusion. I mean, some of what was in the cup of jo- might be joyful as far as experience goes, because David had said in Psalm 23, 5, my cup overflows. But Jeremiah had a little different take because it might be a little harsh. He speaks of the cup of God's wrath in, in Jeremiah twenty two fifteen, which is the consequences of being sinful people who are living in a fallen world. Then in Luke, we read in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prays in Luke 22, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So this cup represents what comes at us in life that we have no control over, but God does. Now, baptism here symbolizes or represents to how we go through all of what comes at us in life. See, when we're baptized as believers, and, and we, we leave behind the old part uh, that was before Christ, and we pass through the waters of baptism to life in Christ. As I like to say when I baptize somebody buried in a water grave to arise to walk in newness of life. See, baptize, baptism represents the choices that we've made to, to repent of our sins and to place our faith and trust in God for His gracious what He graciously supplies us, which is new life in Christ. And so we die to self and we die to sin so that we can live with Christ. And Je- Jesus is talking about his, his journey to the cross. His rejection, his humiliation and suffering and the mocking and the flogging and the spitting and the agony of crucifixion, being forsaken from the Father, all of that on our behalf, the cup, the baptism that he will go through. It represents the submission, his submission to the will of God. What will lead to his resurrection and his glory? And so Jesus asked James and John, are you able? And they reply almost arrogantly, sure, we're ready. We can take it on. We're able. And so Jesus tells him, you know what? You will. You will suffer for my sake. But the glory of being on the right hand or the left hand That's something that Jesus just doesn't give out to whoever gets there first. He says it's for those who have been prepared. And so the journey and and where it leads is in the hands of Almighty God. And see, Jesus is saying God chooses those who he will honor. And God uses the cup and he uses baptism to prepare that person for that honor. And God leads them through all of that, and then God honors them. And what's promised does, uh, it, it, you know, it does come to James and John. God had prepared a journey for them to travel, and Jesus was going to be with them on that journey. And in fact, in Isaiah 43, in verse 2 and 3, we read, that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. James and John are the front and the very back covers of the history book of what it means to be an apostle, of what it means to follow Jesus, the sacrifice, the very cost of apostleship, the cost of being a disciple. You see, when Herod Agrippa had become governor of Judea by and was appointed by Rome, he unleashed persecution on Christians, and he specifically singled out James as his focus point on his hatred towards Christians. And in 44 AD, James was arrested. And Acts chapter 12 tells us that James was the first apostle to be martyred. John died last. 
testimony of early church fathers tell us that records show that the emperor tried to kill John by boiling him in a cauldron of oil. But he miraculously escaped and survived. And then John was exiled to Patmos. And later, he probably died of natural causes, we believe, around 100 A.D. Now, both James and John suffered the same humiliation and the same punishment as they followed Jesus. They drank the cup and were baptized, and God answered their prayer. And he prepared them and led them through all that they had uh, been promised. And you know what? One day you and I are going to get to see them on their throne. One day we're going to get to see that. You see, but at this point in time, James and John were kind of ignorant of what they were asking. And Jesus is helping them understand there's a price that paid that leads to glory. And we need to understand that Almighty God desires to unfold His divine plan in our lives. The journey that we are on leads to what God has, has promised us in Christ Jesus. And it's a journey that He has prepared for us, and He's going to lead us through as we trust and obey Him. Now, there's a third thing that we need to look at here this morning in verses 41 to 45, and that's we see from the example of Jesus. Because where Mark records that then the other guys, when they hear James and John ask this of Jesus, they were indignant. Now, that's a word we've seen already as we've looked in Mark. James and John had gotten to Jesus first. And so they were indignant because they hadn't jumped ahead in line. And they said, well, why didn't I get up there? Why didn't I think of that? Indignant is that word that was translated in the, from the Greek language back in verse 14 when, when Jesus, it says, was indignant at the disciples because they rebuked the parents from letting the little children come to Jesus so that Jesus could bless them. Remember that? Indignant is, is Jesus grieving over the moral failure of the disciples who were more interested in their self-interest than they were in God's interest. See, the disciples were, they were displaying some of the heartless and hard-heartedness of the, of the Pharisees and the scribes instead of the tender-heartedness, uh, the love and the grace and the mercy of God towards those parents of those children who were coming to faith. The other ten disciples... They wanted the positions of prominence and preeminence and, and proximity and power. I mean, Jesus had promised to them all that stuff as well, and that's a good thing. But they're indignant because they realized they failed to, to ask the very same thing. They're indignant because they're still thinking that somehow this is a competition. Somehow this is a competition. We're grabbing and trying to grab position in, in the kingdom of God rather than living by uh, the life of sacrifice and faith that leads to glory to them by God. And Jesus doesn't rebuke them, but he explains to the other ten about their ignorance. And this time he uses himself as a real-life example of what it means to trust. He's the example of what it means to follow God through that cup, through that baptism, and what those represent. Because in verse 41 he says, And you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. You see, leadership by the world standard is by using authority of position and power as a means of controlling others for selfish gain, lording it over others. And the great ones exercise authority over others. So there's political line jumping. And in verse 44, Jesus uses slavery as an example. For the Romans and the Greeks... Slavery was a shameful experience. And in contrast to slavery, the Romans and the Greeks measured greatness in terms of authority, like Caesar. Caesar, the Roman emperor, was worshipped like a god. 
And he alone possessed preeminence. He alone possessed position. He alone possessed power to command whatever he wanted to, as much as he wanted, in the, in the world. Slaves obeyed their master. Masters obeyed the king. As someone said, it's good to be king. See, the temple authorities, the religious leaders of Israel, the people that were constantly in conflict with Jesus uh, had bought into that same world system. They owned slaves. They were into the line jumping. They were wanting to jump over the nations and each other to try to secure their own position of lording it over others. Jesus, though, in verse 43, he said, but it shall not be so among you. In other words, he's saying, stop looking at the world's model of preeminence and position and power for what it means to follow me. What you desire is good. How you're choosing to get there is ignorant, and it's wrong. It's a wrong model. It's a wrong means. And so in contrast, verse 43 says, whoever would be great among you must be the servant or the diakonos. And whoever must be at first among you must be the slave or doulos of all. Diakonos is the Greek word from which we get the word deacon. From the church in the church, there is the position of deacon. Some places refer to them as offices. It's not an office, it's a position. Biblically, it's a position of service. The deacons are the one who are responsible to take care of the poor and the needy in the congregation, to distribute money and collection, and to take care of the needs of people. A deacon is someone who serves to meet the needs of another person. And the word describes a person who's doing the serving as they choose to do that service on the behalf of someone else. And we at Westside are blessed with some of the very best. To become great means choosing to serve. Now, to be the doulos, to be a slave, is a harsher word than diakonos. To be a slave means to give oneself totally to the need and service of someone else. It's to be given over totally to the will of someone else. It's to be legally bound in a relationship of servitude to someone else. So to become first means to say, I want to become a slave of all, not just the lovable, not just those I gravitate to, but even to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and to the scribes of our lives, the critics of our lives. You see, in the kingdom of God, greatness isn't about how high we climb on a ladder or, you know, stepping on the people on the way up. But greatness in the kingdom of God is how low we're willing to descend for the sake of others. Greatness is not about seeking our own honor, but about seeking the honor of others. In the kingdom of God, the king bows in service to his subject, and those who hold the greatest authority are the slaves of all. Verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to serve, be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is an astounding statement coming from Jesus, considering, after all, who he is. That's an astounding When you consider Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus who heals the sick and demonstrates his divine authority over disease. Jesus who cast out the demons and demonstrates his divine authority over Satan. Jesus who calms the storms and walks on the water and demonstrates his divine authority over nature. Jesus who raises the dead and demonstrates his divine authority over death. Jesus who miraculously feeds thousands and demonstrates his divine authority and love and grace and mercy and he's able to provide for all our needs. Jesus who speaks and teaches with the authority of God himself, who is the divine authority to forgive sins. Jesus who has come to serve, to be deacon, to be slave, to be doulos, 
Jesus who has come to give his life as a ransom for many, and that includes a ransom for us. At this point, I think it's really a good reminder for us to remember Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he, he made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant and being in the, born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's the example of Jesus. What it means to follow Jesus to becoming a slave servant, giving our life in service to others, even if it means our death. That's the prepared path of glory as we follow Jesus, following God's will. This morning I got to ask, what cup are you holding? What baptism are you passing through? What are you going through? And I want to encourage you to hold on to this. Jesus walks ahead of us on the journey because he knows the way because he is the way. Jesus is the risen Lord. He's victorious over what life may throw at us, no matter how overwhelming, whatever we might be going through. As long as we're following Jesus, we are going to be okay. So to follow Jesus means to to walk in total surrender, to be obedient to God's will. God's going to sustain us. He's going to bring us through to whatever he's promised us now and forever. And so this morning as we come to our invitation, I want to remind you from Paul's words to the Christians in Rome. You see, followers of Jesus, when Mark was writing his gospel, They could see the cup of persecution on the horizon. It was coming. And by the time Paul writes, he's writing, they were going, passing through that persecution. How important these truths were to them. How important they are to us as we choose to follow Jesus. This morning I want to read from Romans 8 and remind us these things. He says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? Shall tribulation or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present, nor anything to come, nor power, or height, or depth, or anything else, and all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This morning as we come to our hymn of invitation, we're going to sing only trust him. That's what it comes down to. So friend, if you're here today and you need some confidence, you need some assurance, you need to know, you don't know that you're in a right relationship with Jesus. There's no reason to walk out these doors and not have some assurance. It's a matter of trusting him. We don't trust ourselves. We can't trust ourselves. We can't trust someone else, but we can trust Jesus. Only trust him. Won't you stand? as we see in this song. And if there is a decision you need to share with us, please do so this morning. It's been good to be able to be with you this morning. Appreciate your presence and participation in our worship time here today. And I hope you've been blessed as we've opened God's word. And it's been an encouragement to you because that's certainly our intent and our, our hope. Don't forget the announcements that are be playing on the screen here and keep those before your mind. Uh, men, uh, we do have a board meeting here uh, after service so don't forget that and uh, there's several other things that are on the on the screen that you'll want to participate and know about so let's go to the Lord right now in prayer 
Father, thank you so much for allowing us the privilege and honor of being in your presence this day. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement of your word. Thank you for the example of Jesus. And Father, how that you show us who you are and what you came to do. And Father, and to, to know that we're a part of your plan and we're, we're a part of your purpose, that you died for us. Lord, that is just mind-boggling and we are so grateful for it. I pray, Lord, that that would impact how we walk and talk and what we do each and every day. Thank you so very much for the love that you've demonstrated to us, and may we demonstrate that to others as well. Father, thank you for this day, for allowing us to be here. Send us from this place, dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence, and bring us back to the next appointed hour. For it's in the name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. Have a great day.